and so it returns. What could it possibly require of little me? Waiting, waiting, waiting here, always waiting for the next to come and play. So, I could cut him, or feed the sweet nectar to it. Seems like a nightmare. Or should I just leave? <laughs> oh, the closet key. Interesting. I'm gonna leave to the south. Let's go to this closet. You unlock the door and creep into the large closet, which appears to be home to many strange vials and instruments of, of some dark alchemy. You rummage around the detritus to find a small wooden bowl. So we have a rusty knife, closet key, wooden bowl now. Progress is happening here. Four tall display cases are positioned around the fancy chamber. At a cursory glance, the towering display cases appear to be a to be filled with a greenish fluid. There's also something else inside them too. Display case one. Reserved within the uh, preserved within the green fluid is a desiccated corpse that looks like it might have once been human. It's missing both arms. The body's the body's one remaining leg is tethered by a chain latched to the base of the display. The mouth has been crudely sewn shut, and a cluster of worm-like creatures are floating out of the gaps of the stitching. So this right here is probably what exactly happened to us when we died the first time when he talked about adding us to the collection. It's these these displays with probably corpses and all of them. Display case two. You find a wolf-like creature hanging upside down in the green fluid. Its poorly stitched stomach cavity has burst open inside the display with ropes of long stringy worms floating out from it alongside its entrails. Looking more closely at the gruesome display, you notice the creature's eye twitch and blink. Okay, so it's still alive, or it's moving. Something's alive inside it that moves it, maybe. Display 3. Two severed human torsos have been stitched together in a gory uh, mirror image at the waist. Ropey clusters of worms are spilling out from the seam. 4. This one is empty, drained of its fluid and lacking a grisly companion within. Well, there's me. That's where, that's where I ended up when I joined the collection. Let's go north. Let's try to let's let's avoid this guy for now. We got a key from him, which led to a bowl. For now, let's just see what else we can do, accomplish here and we'll come back if we can't proceed without him. Let's see, large door. The heavy door is decorated with scratch marks and dried blood stains. It's locked. Oh, okay, so we need to deal with this guy. But we have the bowl. Oh, the sweetness. We have to go back down to the citrus and use our bowl. South. South. Let's see. Ornate door or go southeast. So you navigate the watery passage with haste, making it to the other end safely. Okay, so we have we can get through easily. Southeast. Uh south door. West. 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 There we go. Reddish substance. This must be the substance the strange creature is thirsting for. You have a bowl to collect the red fluid liquid with. Moving closer to the pungent ooze cascade, you carefully position the ornate wooden bowl beneath one of the uh, streams and manage to collect a generous amount of the red sticky goo. The an unsettling cackle echoes through the dungeon far off from the east. The red goo? The sticky, sweet-smelling substance you've gathered rolls around in the bowl. What is this stuff? Your stomach growls. It feels like ages since you've had anything to eat or drink. Oh, Jesus. I'm not going to trust this stuff. Let's not touch it. Sto we're gonna st instead of taking a sip, we're just going to stow the bowl of goo, the bowl of goo, and head for the throne room. Maybe something, maybe something good can happen if we take it to the creature. Maybe it'll help us. There's not much reason to think that because it killed me last time, but maybe... Maybe that only happens because we hadn't feed it, fed it first? Maybe if you feed it first, we're better off. We'll find out. Does it feed me the delicious sweet nectar I crave? I miss it so dearly. I smell that it has brought me something nice. Will it give me a taste of the sweetness to little me? Yes. The sweetness. 
You bring the bowl of sticky red fluid to its beak. The creature takes a sip. A moment of pure ecstasy washes over his face. Then it writhes and convulses with a sickening gurgle as it strains against the chains. After a moment of this, the convulsions subside. It gives little me another sweet taste, please. The creature rasps breathlessly. Dare I? Let's try it again. Ah, yes. Again, the creature hungrily swallows another gulp of, with a newfound desperation. This is followed by another bout of writhing, more violent than before. The creature looks pale and sickly now. More. It gives little me more. I think this is going to kill it. Which might be ideal, actually. If I, fe if I feed this until it dies, then it, I might get whatever lets me out of this place, and it maybe it won't kill me. Or maybe it'll go so violent that it actually breaks out the chain, and, th and then just kills me. Uh, rest of the ooze. He pour the final draught down its beak, and the bird creature rides in agony one last time. It twitches, jerks its head to the side, then stops moving. After a moment of stillness, the creature's skin pulsates and begins to liquefy. You look closer at the bleached bones of the bird creature's skeletal remains, and notice a strange object in the pile. It's, it's another key, larger than the first. I figured as much. You grab the larger key. Alright, large door. Can we get out now? It's decorated in scratch marks and blood stains. it's locked. Try the key. You place the key in the lock and it fits. You unlock the door, and the key immediately crumbles away to dust in your hands. You step through the doorway and enter into a sprawling cavern. The door slams shut behind you and disappears. The floor drops off in a sharp cliff up ahead, though you can't yet see what lies beyond. A dim reddish glow illuminates the cavern walls beyond the precipice, and you, uh, you also hear a roiling gurgle and bubbling sound echoing from the path ahead. Approach the edge. As you creep closer to the edge, a thunderous howl reverberates through the cavern. You look down at the sickening mass writhing below. What the... Alright. I expect Lovecraft to take a role here. It looks like a giant toothed maggot spewing liquid. Is that the same liquid we saw before, perhaps? The cave floor on the ground below is almost entirely covered in a mixture of slime and thick ropey strands of mucus. A giant worm-like beast is perched on the far side of the cavern, belching blasts of a sweet-smelling red substance from a putrid orifice. The vile liquid flows outward from its pulsing frame and pulls to the opposite end of the cavern. You watch it slowly drain in the hole in the wall, traveling to the deeper reaches of the underground realm. The massive creature undulates and writhes every few seconds, releasing more of the noxious fluid. Another howl, howl from the beast echoes through the, the cavern. It's partially blocking the path ahead. Do I investigate or just try to leave? Let's look around the upper cavern. Your eyes scan the nooks and crannies of the upper cavern. The beast howls again, shaking the cavern walls. It knocks loose a few fist-sized stones along the wall. You also notice a narrow ledge you didn't see before. It appears to creep around the side of the cavern, but you can't see where it leads. Can I grab the stone? You pick up a stone, you consider your options. I can hurl the stone, hurl the stone at the beast, try to slink across the narrow edge, climb down to investigate the lower level. Let's investigate. The cliff is steep. It's a fair drop, a far drop. Grasping the lip, you slink over the edge and begin lowering yourself down the rocky wall. You reach halfway point where your fingers slip. Well, that's not good. The forceful impact knocks the wind out of you and sends your, your sparse possessions skittering into the pool of sticky red fluid. Oh great, our inventory is empty. <laughs> Luckily, the worm creature appears to not notice you fumble. That or it doesn't care for the moment. The only way around the Great Worm is by wading through the pool of red fluid. Your first few steps into the sticky red pool are unpleasant, but you proceed further to circumvent the wrath of the worm. The pool deepens and you find yourself up to your chest in the horrible stuff. By that point it's too late. Enough of the poisonous substance has seeped into your pores. In a mind addled daze, you barely notice that the flesh on your submerged extremities has melted away. Your eyes roll back into your skull, and then out of your skull entirely, 
as you rest, as the rest of you dissolves rapidly into the viscous red fluid. You've perished one of the many horrible ways. Try again to seek to change your fate. Son of a bitch. That's not nice. Okay, so we're back where we left off. I can either climb down to investigate, which inevitably leads to you dying, apparently, and there's nothing you can do about it. So, look around the upper caravan, look around the nooks and crannies, fist-sized stone gets dropped. If I hurl at the beast, I feel like I'm going to get obliterated, so I think I need to try to sneak past on the narrow ledge. The ledge is barely wide enough to get a footing on, but you manage to creep out into the upper caravan uh, cavern as you grip the wall tightly. Inch by inch, you move your way across the gap. When you finally risk a glance at the ground below, you realize that you're right above the worm beast, which is when the fragile ledge crumbles beneath your feet, sending you flailing downwards towards the grotesque creature and right into its gaping maw. Well, son of a bitch. You're thrust into dank, put uh, putrescent darkness as the slippery membrane of the beast's stomach intimately caresses your flesh. As your air runs out and digestive ju juices begin burning your eyes and skin, you remember the rusted knife tucked away in your belt. The blade handle hits your grasp. Uh, pulling it with all your strength, you plunge the jagged blade into the creature's stomach wall. Iker, I, I don't ever know it's Iker or Iker, spills over you and the world tremors with violent force. You frantically stab again at the darkness. The blade cuts deeper again, again and again. Just as your strength begins to fail, you see a, a crack of light and push towards it, slicing with your last will to survive. Precious air. It comes in big gulps, birthed in a membrane of blood and slime. You emerge from the worm's innards very much alive. The giant worm, however, is lying is lying still in a growing pool of its own fluids. Foul. You wipe off as much as you can and make haste to the stairwell beyond. As you descend, the rough-hewn cave passage gives way to... Oh. You draw deeper into the well-lit chamber ahead. Well, there we go. I made it. Actually, I thought I was dead when he, when he fell. I thought that was definitely like, you've died another horrible way. A little weird about how they sometimes just skip ahead on the dialogue without letting you click or anything. That's kind of a bummer. So in the chamber ahead, new map. Torches illuminate the entire length of this de uh, decadently adorned hall. A series of gallery paintings are hung along the north wall, while a towering statue stands watch over the far eastern wall. I really hope that the new map means we have a new starting point on that one screen, hopefully, and we don't have to start the whole game over again every time. Let's look at the paintings. A trio of paintings rest on the wall, each depicting a scene. Painting one. A small silver plaque below the painting reads, The Silent Library. It's a library with what looks like the silhouette of death with a scythe down there. Oh god, touch the painting. Is that a, is that a mistake? You reach out and touch the canvas. And the moment your finger makes contact with the aged paint, the room spins into a blur. Knots coil in your stomach as your body is wrenched into the air. When the world stops spinning and you regain your senses, you find yourself in a study brimming with books. Okay, so you can travel into these. You can literally travel into these paintings. There's three paintings in this hallway and you can just enter them and they're all separate dungeons of some kind. A warm glow emanates from the crackling fire. You're tempted to recline in one of the fine leather chairs positioned near stacks of books in this well-stocked study. A fine piece, a piece of signed parchment rests on a small table by the fire. The only exit is a door to the north. Let's look at the, par the parchment. It reads, Chapter 2, Texts of Damnation. So now we're in Chapter 2, apparently. The books? Several books with intriguing titles stand out from the rest. Select a book to read. The Sting of Passion. The book is titled The Sting of Passion. It describes the exploits of a lustful empress whose thirst runs deeper than mere carnal pleasures of the flesh. Continue reading. You become engrossed in this particular passage. Every third moon, Lady Ballantine issued a call throughout the kingdom seeking suitors to satiate her particular desires. So powerful was her allure, her dark majesty that dozens of able-bodied men and women would flock to the gates of her spire and bear themselves without shame of hesitation for her meticulous scrutiny. 
the most pleasing of whom were selected and granted entrance into her palace, where they, uh, where they were stripped, washed, and anointed in preparation. In small groups, the devotees would be led to the Empress's private quarters, which would echo with screams of passion for hours on end. Without a fail, they proved eager, attentive lovers, their bodies pressed against the, emp the Empress and Mass in writhing ecstasy, entangled in the thrall of their fatal pleasures. For when each particular, uh, when each partic uh, participant reached the height of passion, their beloved Empress would caress them lovingly as she produced a sharp blade and drove it deep inside them, lapping up their crimson essence and running her fingers through the gaping wound as the life spilled forth from them. Despite the glimpse of their impending fate, the evening's proce proceedings continued until, one after another, each devotee uh, eagerly succumbed to the Empress's unpl unflinching need. When the final breath rattled free from the last pairs of lips, all that remained was the Empress, cloaked in their entrails and flush with gleaming power none could resist. He closed the book. Several books with intriguing titles stand out from the rest. I'm wondering if these books are going to somehow affect the world around me, or if they're just kind of books. I mean, I just walked into a painting, so who knows? But I can't help but take a look at them, particularly because the writing in this game is actually pretty strong, and it's, in, it's enjoyable to read, even though it's horrible. <laughs> the Creeping Doom. The book is titled The Creeping Doom. It's a handwritten series of diary entries penned by a lone explorer who finds something amiss in the deep forest. Continue reading. You become engrossed in this particular passage. Day 12. My trek through the azure forest has been far from uneventful. Today the East River current cost me, uh, caught me in a crossing, and it was a full 15 minutes later that I managed to snag a passing branch downstream and hoist myself to the riverbank, dripping head to toe. I write this entry, I'm sure to the great amusement of nearby woodland creatures, in my birthday suit while my clothes dry by the fire. I do hope they hurry up and get it on, on with it soon. This log is chafing my backside. Not a great end to an otherwise productive day. Day 13. Today's shortcut through the swamps was unexpectedly pleasant. Bleh. What a breaky bog. But I believe it will be worth the effort should it shave a few days' hike off my path to the base of Mount Greybund. I hope to begin my ascent as soon as possible. Unfortunately, Mother Nature has war a warped sense of humor. I've been bitten all to hell by mammoth-sized mosquitoes, and I seem to be developing some sort of aggressive rash on my posterior. Perhaps I caught a touch of the poison oak after yesterday's watery shenanigans. Lovely. Day 14. I was starting to feel a bit sore down there. On a whim, I dug out my shaving mirror to have a look at my aching bum, and what would you know it, it's covered in red welts. Looks like some kind of nasty bites of some sort. Itchy bastards, too. Day 16. I must have gotten a little turned around after my swamp excursion because I don't appear to be anywhere near the proper base of the mountain. The forest is thicker around these parts, too, which makes it hard to get my bearings. Also, last night I woke to a start when I felt something crawling on me. Gave me the heebie-jeebies, but... After I bolted up and pranced around like a fool, I couldn't find anything there. Curious. Maybe it was night terrors. I've literally jumped out of bed thinking stuff was on me before. <laughs> Day 17. Finally found my way to a nice grassy clearing, but tripped over something and twisted my ankle. When I went to investigate, I found the skeletal remains of some kind of deer-like creature. Gross. Decided to make my camp here anyway, because I'm sick of pine pitch and pokey branches. Some intrepid explorer I turned out to be. This seems to be a chronicle of reasons why you don't do this stuff alone. Day 18, I'm beginning to think the, cartog the cartographer was on some kind of psychedelic herb when he sketched this particular map. It feels like I'm going in circles. I also noted something peculiar today, but I can't quite put my finger on it. The trees just look a little funny. Maybe I'm getting delirious from eating nothing but canned beans and squirrel meat. Maybe I'll sprout some buck teeth and, de and develop a taste for acorns. At least the welts on my ass are now healing up nicely. Day 21. Finally. I think I've found my way back on track here. Things are looking up, eh? Day 23. Damn it. Those nasty bites have returned and they've spread. 
Hurts like hell now. This is no joke. Something is not right here. The sounds of the forest seem to have gotten louder, too. I keep thinking I'm seeing things at the corner of my eye, but when I turn, there's nothing there. Am I going batty? Think it's time to bag this trip and head back to civilization. Screw the mountain. Day 25. I don't know where they're coming from, but they're all over me. And they've changed. They're like big bulbous pimples or something. Awful. 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 I need to get a medic. I need to get to a medic. I need to get out of here. The writing is getting more scribbled and harder to read. Day 26. I don't know where they're coming from, but they're everywhere. I've been retching blood. I have a fever. I don't think I'm going to make it. You can barely make out this passage. Day 27. One of the la one of the damn things popped open and my arm on my arm and something crawled out. God help me. They're all over. I don't know what's hap That's the last entry. He closed the book. Well, that's horrible. So something infected him and spread all over his body and then just spewed everywhere. Like he was full of spider eggs or something. That's kind of where I thought that was going to go pretty early on. When, I, when he first talked about welts, I thought of the, the fact that like you can get infected by these weird worm-like creatures that can actually... They create rashes that are like straight lines under your, on your skin, and it's actually because they're burrowing ac across your skin, basically. It's really fucked up. <laughs> Although it's not quite in the territory of that, I don't think. But it's still pretty bad. Nothing left to give. Of course I'm going to read all these stories. They're compelling, even though they're horrible. It describes a young couple's struggle for uh, survival while lost in an arctic storm. You find yourself captivated by a particular passage. Deanna knew her injuries would slow her down, slow them down, and the growing pain in her side was nearly too much to bear. Without food or water, they had little chance to make it back to the shelter and weather the storm in this weakened state. And they had been wandering for days, unable to regain the bearings of the tundra wastes. The howling winds kissed their frostbitten cheeks as blinding snow threatened to engulf them in its icy embrace for eternity. It was the numbness creeping into the extremities, slowly at first, then with a quickening finality that most alarmed them. Yet, the couple pushed onward in spite of the inevitable, grasping for a sliver of hope. Jamon knew Deanna's strength, her slipping health, her will to continue on was fading fast. His own was faltering too, as the last remnants of daylight seeped away into the wintry void. They were lost. Weary from exhaustion, the couple found a lean-to amidst a, cor a copse of barren trees and collapsed in the snow. They huddled together to try to eke out every bit of warmth from their bodies. Jamon built a small fire using the last of his tinder. It was a struggle, but they needed to eat. Delirious with hunger and weak from her injuries, Deanna's vision slipped in and out of focus. She remembered Jamon mentioning food, but they were all out of anything to eat. It had been so long since she had let a nice warm meal, hunger not at the hazy edges of her consciousness. Did they just shuffle off into the darkness, or was it a hallucination? Talking about food, is this going to be a cannibalism story? <laughs> a pop of the fire awoke. Deanna, from her feverish slumber, the smell of cooked meat set her stomach aflutter. I can't believe it, but I caught us a rabbit, he said, in response to her sudden stirring. It's almost ready. Too weak and groggy to move, Deanna's excitement grew when the warm chewiness of, cook of cooked rabbit met her lips. She hadn't expected to eat another meal, given their dire situation. It's so good. Jamon winced a smile, just as a blast of arctic wind rattled the fire. Eat up. This is all for you. You need the strength. I'll be fine. He refused to eat, despite her weak protests. I think he's literally feeding her himself. Because they're hopeless. I love you, he whispered, and fed her another portion. That night, Deanna slept in a deep peace, a serenity she hadn't recalled in weeks. By warning, the storm had cleared, leaving a blue sky and sun-drenched brightness in the wake of the tumultuous night. When Deanna opened her eyes, she saw smoke from the settlement campfires not far off in the distance. Look, we're not far. We're going to make it. No reply. She summoned the strength to sit upright and look around. Jamon was propped up on the opposite side of the campfire. His eyes were open, but he wouldn't respond. Jamon? 
It wasn't until she rose and stepped towards him that she saw the knife in the snow and the bed of crimson splayed around Juman, who lay pale and motionless, gazing unblinking towards the bright, scunny sky. When she broke free from the shock, Diana howled in anguish, tears freezing to her face as she drove to Juman's side, clutching his parka and shook him. No, 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 no. She felt his body and noticed a tear in his pant leg, which was wrapped up with a scarf and soaked in blood. Pulling back the, the clock, she found chunks of Jaman's leg missing, carved away in tidy chunks. Her, her jaw dropped. She stammered and recoiled, clutching her chest. There were no signs of rabbit in sight. He closed the book. Called it immediately. That's dark. But yeah, that she, that, this is... Even when it's a predictable, even when I know where the story is going, it's just actually like a, this, these are decent. This is all pretty well written, so it's an enjoyable experience to read. 